Uh, Libby, this is an interesting development here with regard to the last few months and Kamala Harris's rise to the top of the ticket. Can you take us through how the election dynamic has changed in your mind, given this particular development and how things project to play out in the next two months? Yeah, Don, well, nice to, nice to be with you. I mean, so we've been talking a lot with our clients, understandably, about the last five weeks, which have been incredibly dramatic. However, sort of the irony is, is that despite all of the events, basically the race is where the race was in the spring uh, when Biden was still at the top of the ticket, meaning that it basically has gone back to being a coin toss, sort of 50-50. Um, obviously, the, the polling for, for Harris uh, has improved, for the Democrats have improved over the last few weeks. But again, kind of going back to where it was in the spring with just sort of a toss-up. Now, I think we, what we're trying to focus our clients on, Dom, just because of the relevance to fiscal policy, both spending and taxes, is the composition of Congress. And that, I actually think, has changed even more significantly over the last few weeks. Five weeks ago, we were looking at a, you know, what looked like a likely Trump presidency with a possible red wave, the Republicans keeping the House and taking over the Senate. And now, again, kind of resetting back to where it was in the spring, where you're actually looking at probably a higher chance of divided government. Um, the Senate may be flipping from Democratic control to Republican control, but the House actually having a good chance of also flipping from Republican control, control to Democratic control. And all of this matters because when you're hearing Kamala Harris over the next you know, few months talking about her economic policy, when you're hearing Donald Trump or J.D. Vance talking about what their economic priorities are going to be, that is all going to be, they're going to be beholden to a, a cooperative Congress. So if they don't actually have, again, sort of a united control, then a lot of these things are really just going to sort of stay in the, the rhetorical uh, area, not actually, uh, you know, be, be kind of real policy. That seems, Libby, to be the conversation that's being had in many asset management circles right now with regard to kind of projecting the outcomes. Uh, let's also now bring in CNBC.com political finance reporter Brian Schwartz, who is also at the Democratic National Convention out in Chicago. Uh, you know, Brian, we just spoke to Eamon about the rise of economic populism. This idea that we may see divided government is also one that's becoming almost consensus now with, with regard to certain parts of Wall Street. How exactly then does the story develop from the DNC about how the economic agenda will look for the Democrats in particular? Well, that's right. I mean, that's being discussed here on the ground in Chicago right now. We've been asking lawmakers, delegates, donors, you name it, uh, since I got here on Sunday, how exactly are Democrats planning to pass and get into law if Vice President Harris becomes president? Uh, any of these things, particularly the specific question of how, the, how is it going to be paid for? Uh, and, and there really hasn't been a clear answer given to me. There's been conversations here about raising the corporate tax rate, but of course that's going to need congressional approval as well. There's talk about raising uh, more taxes in a way on wealthier people, cutting some of the tax loopholes. Uh, but again, some of these things are going to need clear congressional approval. And on a divided Congress in the next term, I don't know how exactly they're going to go about paying for some of these Harris-based plans. L Libby, what exactly is the base case scenario? For, when, when you talk to your clients, what exactly is the projection that you guys have? And then is divided government the best course of action for the economy to continue growing? Or do we need to see movement on things like an Inflation Reduction Act or a CHIPS Act or other fiscal stimulus to get things moving in the right direction? Yeah, well, Dom, and so, so what we're telling our clients is it's still early, even though this feels like the longest general election cycle, I think, probably in all of our lifetimes. Um, we still are more than two months out. As we know, a lot can change. We're telling them, though, to really focus on those key swing states, Pennsylvania in particular, probably the most important state, Georgia also very important, both to, for Trump and for Harris, and then, of course, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Nevada and Arizona, but really the Pennsylvania is in many ways the keystone state, uh, sort of part of the pun here. Um, in terms of sort of the outlook, though, for, for you know, policy and divided government, I mean, what we're telling our clients is that the biggest loser here 
regardless of who wins in November, is truly the U.S. deficit. And that is because in all of this economic discussion on both the left and the right, no one's really talking about deficits to, to, uh, you know, sort of to what Brian was just saying. No one's talking really substantively about pay-fors. Um, and no one really seems to be concerned with the fact that we are, you know, past 100 percent debt to GDP levels. Interest expense <laughs> may actually take over the Pentagon spending. So that we really do think that will be sort of the biggest loser. But to your point, divided government probably means more gridlock and less deficit spending. So I think the market actually probably likes that more. They also like more certainty. If you've looked actually at the S&P performance back to 1933, the market usually performs better when there is divided government. So it just sort of corroborates that, uh, that thesis.